Well, let's talk to John O'Connell, though, from the Taxpayers Alliance, because yesterday uh, there was this leaked report from the Treasury, which may or may not have been a genuine uh, article or may just have been a kind of one of those floated ideas to see how things go, suggesting uh, that 300 billion quid might have to be raised to cover the cost of all of this COVID-19 pandemic sort of bailout. Um, and the suggestion was that there might have to be a public uh, pe sector pay freeze, there might have to be taxes raised. John O'Connell from the Taxpayers Alliance, uh, I think, is going to suggest that that that's a bad idea. John, a very good morning to you. Morning, Mike. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I'm always slightly sceptical when I see these leaked Treasury reports about whether or not they were actually anything more than a suggestion and anything more than a framework for discussion rather than actually something the government was definitely going to do. Yeah, um, it's the kind of exercise that goes on in the Treasury constantly. You, you, you know, you'd be surprised if they weren't doing yes. stuff like this to work out how to pay for COVID-19 and, and, and the response. Um, but when they leak out, it does suggest that they want to sort of test these ideas to see how, what the public reaction is. Yes. And I don't think the public reaction to um, across-the-board income tax hikes is going to be all that good, um, uh, no. to be honest with you. No, I mean, on the, um, by the same token, though, I suppose I don't think there's many people in the country who don't think that all of this money which is being created and all of this money which is being loaned out uh, is going to come with no cost whatsoever. No, absolutely right. And that, that's, that's a tricky situation. I mean... Um, those of us who believe in sort of sound public finances, you know, um, living within your means, I think we're going to have to sort of accept that the deficit will be going up, um, this kind of thing. But, you know, in, in terms of paying for all of this, um, borrowing does seem to be um, the way that they look, are looking to do it. I don't think that they're going to uh, introduce across the board income tax hikes. They might look at things like a wealth tax or other things like that, but, I, I you know, Look, when the economy's on its knees, the last thing you do is go in and pick at the bones. Um, you know, we really need uh, businessmen and businesswomen across the country to have the breathing space to come out of this, to sell their products again, um, without the tax man knocking on the door asking for more money. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, what other alternatives do they really have, though? Because um, short of raising taxes, there's not very many ways the government can actually um, get any income, is, is there? Well... Uh, the, the the best answer for me is a slightly longer term one, and that is a relentless focus on economic growth, yeah. to be shamelessly pro-growth and to say, right, OK, we're going to relax regulations, we're going we're gonna to lower your tax burden. If that means that the deficit goes up for five years, so be it, but we're going to grow our way out of this. We're not yes. just going to, you know, tax everyone to, you know, to, to their last dollar and, and just have... You know, these, these short-term fixes for the public finances, we need a longer-term plan where we simplify taxes and we grow our way out of this. Because let's not forget, that's actually going to be the answer coming out of the EU as well. We need to have a sort of dynamic, modern, um, you know, future-facing, trading with the world economy. And the, it's the same answer of coming out of this crisis. It's to grow our yes. way out of it and be shameless um, in our pursuit of it. No, I agree, totally agree with you. Funnily enough, that's precisely presumably what they were doing before this, this, this coronavirus thing hit properly, sort of mid to late March, when they were, were sort of you know, two months on from, from leaving the European Union. But you're absolutely right, because in the end, I've always said this, that the, the economy is so fragile right now that they cannot allow it to die, they cannot allow it to collapse completely. Completely. Every single country in the world is in the same boat. And it's all to do with stimulus, isn't it, at this point? It's all to do with things that perhaps the Conservative Party wouldn't normally do. But it's all about making sure that there's more money available for people, that businesses do not go to the wall. Um, and actually, if they do it right, it could produce a real economic boom. Yeah, I, that's absolutely right. I think that, you know, for a group like ours, which you know, preaches prudence and all the rest of it. When when the government stepped in with, with loans for small businesses and not all of these things, you know, it might be counterintuitive for a group like the Taxpayers Alliance to say this is a good thing. But we thought it was a good thing. We've got to keep these businesses going so that when we do come out the other side, um, we can do exactly what we've just been talking about, you yeah. know, start that economic boom. Um, but it won't be done by strangling them with taxes and regulations. I mean, would you, um, go, be... would you go the other way and say, how about you actually change the tax structure to make it more user-friendly so that it isn't actually quite as punishing? Oh, without question. I think we need, um, as well as lower taxes, um, we've got a 50-year high tax burden, let's remember, mm. going into this crisis. Uh, that's pre-COVID. So, um, you know, what we don't want to do is add to that. So as well as lower taxes, we should have simpler taxes. Mm. You know, um, we, we should have a much sort of more overarching plan for what the tax system should look like in 10 years to make us the best place in the world to do business. Mm. Um, and COVID-19 should not slow down that, that kind of pursuit, you know. 
Um, I mean, a lot of businessmen could... that I'm talking to at the moment, particularly during this particular situation, are saying we could really do with a little bit of help on the VAT front, not just to postpone paying it, which is what the government have offered, but to actually reduce the uh, uh, the VAT rateable value, but also to reduce the VAT on certain things. Because, you know, as many restaurateurs have told me, you know, they're struggling, they can't open the restaurant. And when they can open the restaurant, they have to pay VAT and they have to charge VAT for anything they sell. But an awful yeah. lot of the things that they buy... Um, they can't actually charge VAT back on because food is not VAT registered. Yeah, the, the, the VAT, it's a, it's a good example, right? The, the VAT really should be about broad base and low rates. We shouldn't really have too many loopholes in that system. What we should have is a, a low rate of VAT um, and, you know, w w with as few loopholes as possible. But they're the kind of things that we should be talking about. And, of course, if you cut VAT... Um, you could see that revenues actually go up because mm. people start spending more money. And that's what we don't talk about enough in this country is the dynamic effects of tax cuts, which is to say that if you cut taxes, you can actually increase the revenues that come in because you, in, you, you incentivize activity. You look at stamp duty. Yeah. If we cut stamp duty, we'd probably see more houses sold of and you'd probably see the coffers go up. So more money for public services, yeah. win, win, win. Well, I mean, certainly um, any economist that you want to talk to will tell you that, you know, there isn't any point in, say, going after, in quotes, the rich, you know, because you, 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 you basically hidebound a few, a few people who generally find a way of getting out of paying it anyway. Uh, rather than doing that, you'd be better off lowering the taxes and getting more people to pay them. Yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the whole system of broad-based low rates again. I mean, um, it's easy to sort of talk about a wealth tax and let's just tax the rich. Mm. There, there, there are a couple of hard truths about that, though. One is that the, the, the richest 1% already pay 27% of all income tax, and the other is that there aren't that many rich people in the country, mm. Mike. Um, you know, we, we assume that London's just awash with all of these uh, you know, billionaires. There's plenty of them, and maybe more in other cities, but there aren't enough to pay the bills in the way that um, it, you know, the left easily just say, you know, just whack some taxes on the rich and everything will be fine. Yeah. It doesn't work, that. It doesn't work, work like that, unfortunately. They're, they're, they're the hard facts. No, exactly right. John, thanks very much indeed. John O'Connell, Chief Executive of the Taxpayers Alliance, they're talking about why um, it would be a terrible idea if the government decided to raise income tax uh, on uh, anyone because they had to pay for this pandemic uh, bailout situation. I think he's right when he says that basically what we need to do is to properly stimulate the economy so that people feel the urge to go out and spend money. People feel as if they should be out there shopping, they should be out there supporting the economy because I think people, when they get the opportunity to do so, as we saw yesterday when we were talking to the uh, estate agents business, you know, people are champing at the bit to do business. As soon as the estate agents were open, they got loads and loads of phone calls and they got loads and loads of bids and loads of inquiries and loads of offers on properties that people wanted to go and view.